welcome you and we thank you for being here this evening. Um, we have some things to bring to your attention about the railroad stop. But before we do that, um, I don't know how many of you are aware of it or not, but um, just within a couple of days, we've had a death here in the city because of West Nile virus. Um, so as a, uh, a public service type of announcement, and we are televising this to get it out to the neighborhoods, we're not sure of exactly where this took place, uh, but uh, as a precaution, we're, um, we're working with the uh, Maryland Department of Agriculture to spray certain areas of the city, um, even though it's getting close to the end of the season for uh, mosquitoes. We're, again, um, operating under a, a, a word of caution or a breath of caution, if you will. So with that, we have with us uh, Mr. Marty Flemian, a Deputy City Administrator, for uh, public safety uh, and Marty you have some information for us if you will go thank you thank you mr. president uh, I was asked by the mayor to prepare a short briefing on uh, the passing of uh, Dorothy Mount and the potential that uh, the passing may have been attributed to West Nile virus uh, I'll start with a summary of uh, how the city was uh, notified uh, yesterday, September 16th, uh, we received reports that Ms. Dorothy Mount, a 94-year-old woman and longtime resident of the city of Laurel, had passed away on September the 8th. The information received by the city stated that according to her relatives, her death was attributed to the West Nile virus. The, well, the relatives advised in the, the email that the cause of death was received from medical staff at the Veterans Medical Center in Baltimore. After reviewing the reports, the city attempted to seek confirmation of the cause of death from the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. As of late this afternoon, the Communication Director's Office for the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene advised that confirmation of the cause of death in this case had still not been received in their office. Later that same day, the city received additional information which indicated that there were two possible locations where the victim may have been infected. The first location being her neighborhood in the city, um, basically the 1000 block of 8th Street, and the second possible location in Baltimore County or possibly Baltimore City. The Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene released a statement Tuesday confirming the death of a Baltimore County man from the West Nile virus on September 8th, the same day Ms. Mount passed away. Contact was made to the Maryland Department of Agriculture to report the suspected case by my office and to request an investigation ad and advice on what needed to be done by the city in the, the event the case of death was confirmed as West, West Nile virus. According to the Maryland Department of Agriculture, the victim's neighborhood, again the 1000 block of 8th Street in Laurel, was sprayed for mosquitoes twice in August, once on the 9th and once again on the 30th. The Maryland Department of Agriculture also advised their crews had sprayed various parts of Laurel a total of seven times this, this season. Um, basically, uh, the re repeated applications were brought about by um, what we understand to be an extremely wet spring, which uh, uh, harbored, the, the, uh, uh, the, harbored the, um, excuse me, harbored the uh, breeding of, of uh, mosquitoes, excuse me. Along with the city, <clears throat> the Maryland Department of Agriculture is also waiting on confirmation of the death in this case. However, at the request of the city, they agreed that weather permitting, they will again spray for mosquito control in Laurel on Sunday, September 20th at dusk. Uh, the entomologist, uh, Jean, Jean Dorothy, who heads the mosquito abatement program for the Maryland Department of Agriculture, says for this application, they will be concentrating on the area between Gorman Avenue, Main Street, and Sandy Spring Road, the trucks will also be spraying 6th, 7th, and 8th and 9th Streets, West Circle, Montgomery Street, and everything east of Sandy Spring Road down to Gorman Avenue, uh, and then over to Route 1. <clears throat> Within the described locations to be treated, there are six no-spray areas uh, where no treatment will be done. The Maryland Department of Agriculture maintains a list of areas where they have been asked not to spray to accommodate res residents with potential medical conditions. These no spray areas for this treatment are as follows, Post Office Avenue and Farms Avenue, Prince George Street between 4th and 5th, 4th Street between Main Street and Montgomery, the vicinity of Carroll Avenue and 5th Street, Laurel Avenue between 4th Street and Route 1, portions of Main Street, Talbot Avenue, Gorman Avenue, or Route 1, and um, 
these areas are primarily due to uh, traffic congestion. The Maryland Department of Agricultural officials say this treatment will likely be the last for the city this season as they have noticed the sharp decline in the mosquito population, primarily due to a regional drop in ambient temperatures and also the uh, spraying program is, is scheduled to end on September 22nd. Following the usual method of application, the spray used to control the mosquito population will be applied by trucks with applicators that atomize the liquid into a fine mist and applied to the neighborhood scheduled to be treated. The mist applied by the crews dissipates in approximately 20 minutes. The Maryland Department of Agriculture advises that the spray is not harmful to plants, people, pets, or ponds and streams. Also, the spray crews will not spray areas where people are congregating. Uh, so if we're asking that if you are, are on the street and you see the trucks in your neighborhood, we ask that they, you go indoors until the treatment application is completed. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention advised that symptoms of West Nile virus will usually show up within 14 days following the bite of an infected mosquito. These symptoms include fever, headache, body aches, fatigue, back pain, skin, skin rash on occasion, swollen lymph glands on occasion, eye pain on occasion. In order to help prevent mosquito bites, it is recommended that when working outside, you wear long, loose-fitting clothing covering as much of the exposed areas on your body as possible and to use insect repellent. Uh, and for, there, there are still um, residents that believe that mosquitoes are, are only a, um, a danger in the evening hours. That's not true. Uh, with the advent of the Asian uh, tiger mosquito, um, basically you're subject to mosquito bites 24-7. Um, that mosquito is prevalent during the daytime. Additionally, residents are urged to take steps to eliminate mosquito breeding grounds on their property, including but not limited to emptying uh, children's pools, changing pet water daily, changing bird baths at least once a week, fixing leaking water faucets, eliminating depressions in your yard or landscaped areas, or any other tools or implements that uh, may be around the foundation or your yard that uh, could hold water. And we are told that uh, it doesn't take much water to harbor breeding of mosquitoes. Uh, some are telling us that uh, uh, a tablespoon of water could, could breed mosquitoes. So we're encouraging residents to take a hard look at, at uh, their properties to make sure that uh, they're not uh, harboring any mosquitoes in standing, standing water. With that, Mr. President, I'll take any questions. Excuse me, do you happen to have that recipe for that magic potion that we were talking earlier today about? Actually, yes, sir, I do. Well, for those of you that are home, you may want to take a pen and pencil real quick, and Mr. Fleming is going to give you this magic potion that uh, is supposed to take care of any mosquitoes that you have in your area. Well, uh, I have at least two people that have uh, come to my office to provide this information, and they are swearing up and down that this is a concoction that works. Uh, basically, uh, it is harmless. Um, it's made up of, uh, um, you take a, a large soda bottle, and you cut the top portion of the soda bottle, and you invert it so that it acts like a funnel into the remainder of the bottle. To that, you add a cup of, of boiling water, one cup of brown sugar, wait till the brown sugar, sugar dissolves. Then you add a quarter tablespoon of yeast, and you take and seal where the uh, inverted top of the bottle, where it meets the uh, bottom of half of the bottle, you take black tape, electrical tape, uh, to close off that. Uh, and the individuals who left my office today said that uh, they're hard pressed to keep the bottom of the uh, device empty of dead mosquitoes. Uh, but uh, if you employ this, uh, please don't, don't set it next to your patio. Uh, you need to set it somewhere in your yard that's a little uh, inaccessible to you and your children or whatever the case may be. But I'm going to try one. Well, I think it's very wise for everyone to try it. And I'm hoping that uh, we'll get uh, Ms. Barnes from Laurel Cable TV to post it on one of her um, shows so that we'll be able to have that out there for everyone to use and if anybody didn't get it down that's here in the audience just uh, we'll stick around here a little bit and you can talk to Mr. Fleming and he'll make sure you get the recipe. Yes sir. You can find that on YouTube. It was developed on YouTube? Over, it was developed over in India uh, because of what they deal with with their high concentration areas and uh, they're trying to get it to the people that are in the 
low population. Well, the brown sugar will get me if nothing else will. <laughs> okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> thank you, Marty. Appreciate your help. With that, we'll go ahead with our regular scheduled program. That sounds familiar. Um, and we'll try and bring you up to date with what's going on with the railroad station. Oh, first of all, does anybody have any questions for Marty about that? Seeing none, we'll just go ahead. Um, we've had two telephone conversations with uh, MDOT since we uh, last met. Most, uh, most of that information, one uh, telephone conversation was 20 minutes and the other conversation was 15 minutes. None of that was really dealing with the uh, railroad station. It was dealing with other issues that um, are facing Howard County in the way of traffic and uh, different intersections in and around the city of Laurel. You see up on the screens here, something that's new that's happened that's very much going to affect the, um, the railroad station. I've asked Mr. Jack Brock from our Department of, Z of Zoning and Planning to come for us tonight to kind of bring you up to date as to what Hawthorne Place is. Mr. Brock. Yes, Mr. President. Uh, President Ricks asked if I would give a, a quick overview of a proposed development that's known as Hawthorne <clears throat> Place. It is proposed to be uh, located behind a Staggers Lane and Marshall. Uh, you can see that on the overview. Thanks, please. This is the phase one of the proposed development. Excuse me, for those of you that don't realize what he's talking about is Staggers Lane. Do we all know where the bowling alley is now? Remember where the old Roadway Express building was over there? That's the property. <coughs> the entire project is proposed to be 1,006 apartment units. 139,000 commercial office space, 1,466 parking spaces, and seven buildings that will vary from five to 16 feet in height. Phase one, which is on the screen now, is 303 apartment units, 2,500 square feet of commercial. The entire project is projected to take an eight year uh, to build out. Uh, it is presently going through the approval process. It'll go to the next planning commission meeting in October, and then it'll be forwarded to the council for uh, approval. This had been approved uh, several years ago. However, it was approved right at the beginning of the recession. Uh, the developer lost his funding source, so over the period of five or six years, all the approvals that had been uh, forthcoming have disappeared. So uh, we're back at the beginning, but the developer, uh, Cohan, Mr. Cohan, uh, does wish to proceed with the development, uh, and he's going, like I say, into the Planning Commission next month for approval. Thank you, Mr. Brock. Now, you're saying to yourself, what does this do with the railroad station? Well, this development is a TOD as well. It's designed to uh, operate around the railroad station. So where Howard County, as we were talking before, has tr trying to get their TOD, which has a thousand units in it, we now have an additional TOD that's coming online that's going to have over a thousand units in it. Those people are, there's different negotiating points that are going on with the city as to how this is going to operate with the railroad station. When I found out about this, when it first came to us about a week ago, I called our friends down at M, M, MDOT. And because in that, in that approval that the council had preliminarily was a letter from MDOT approving the whole project and I got to thinking okay does the rest of the state of Maryland know about this and if so 
how is that going to affect the Howard County people? Or are they getting a are Howard County and MDOT going to get in a big fight? So I called them and I said, are you aware about Hawthorne? And they said they knew it was somewhere, but it was dead. And I said, no, it's not dead. It's been brought back to life and you guys ought to be aware of it. And so they have been looking into it and trying to do their homework. So I think this has delayed any further meetings between Ms. Mills and myself with MDOT because they're trying to figure out how their director and this district approved that project again without the big boys downtown finding out about it. It said to me, and I quote, maybe that's the reason why he was fired. So I think they're in a quandary as to what they do next. But when Ms. Mills and I go back to the table, we're going to be taking this with us because this is even more of a reason to not move our stop. We have 800 and, 800 and some people now that take that train every day. We now have a potential for another five to 700 people taking that train based on this development. And so therefore, I think we even have more of an argument than we did before. So with that being said, I mean, I can answer um, some other questions that you've got. I can go back to some of the things that we talked about a couple of weeks ago when we met. Um, any of my colleagues that you wish to answer any questions, we'd be more than happy to try and answer them. But if you would come forward and turn the microphone on, and we'll try and uh, answer any of your questions that you have. Come, come on. You know how to press the little button? <laughs> press it down until it goes green. There you yeah. go. Actually, my question was to ask for your comments on, I, if you saw the story in the Washington Post last Sunday, on, on the station, um, what was the, the only part that I found particularly disturbing, other than having a few factual pieces of information wrong, was that uh, Mr. Schrader, when asked about the station, basically said that he thought that uh, two stops was not feasible. And I wondered if you had a comment on that comment from him. Ms. Query? Well, uh, as you know, with the media, we report what we want to report. Mr. Schrader has mentioned that, but not from his opinion. He thought that Sierra X wouldn't go along with two stops. Um, so his paragraph is much larger than that one quote. Um, he's also said, too, he's entertained the thought as far as the um, alternating stations. So half of it would go there and then here. But, um, you know, as um, Eddie and I were talking about the um, Hawthorne place. It's, they didn't have a clue. And it was one of the uh, state people had mentioned it, but they just kind of glossed over it during one of our meetings. And so Eddie brought it up again and said, do you realize this is going on? So um, he's been very cordial to us. He's reminded us that he, as a public official, has to walk a fine line. He's walking on that four-inch beam, if you will. Um, but he's there are five possibilities that are out there. And he essentially, um, at the last meeting, was talking to us about the Laurel uh, train stop isn't going anywhere. Now, can he promise an eternity? No. So that's the point where we're at without it being in writing. So I wouldn't put too much weight in the two stops issue. Mr. Lewis. I just, as Karen pointed out, author of, author of that piece wrote a nice article. He underestimated the number of people that get on in Laurel. He underestimated the number of parking spaces that are there. Okay? Um, because he, he wasn't counting the Legion, Mr. Frederick's places that he lets people park on, park on. He just didn't count everything. And I'm sure, I don't know where he got the numbers from. It doesn't matter. They, just the factual information was a little bit wrong. Um, <clears throat> the, the issue of, you know, it's, it's 2,500 square feet, CRX might not allow it. I'm not convinced CRX has much of a say. What they have a say in is the windows that you can move tr uh, uh, passenger traffic up and down the rail line. That's what they have a say in. So I'm not so sure that 
you know, that may just be a, let me push it off over here on them. And again, let me, I, I have great respect for Mr. Schrader, but he's in that position to make decisions, not to walk a fine line. He needs to consider everything and make the right decision. And for somebody who said you must have it in for the Canadians, I didn't because I wrote a letter and I mentioned the Canadians eight times in the letter. My mother was Canadian. We had businesses in Canada. But what I didn't appreciate was the way that the people with the track came down here and again, in the dark of night, they started on this route to take our stop away from us for their benefit. That brings me to the last issue. They're going to build a thousand car garage. That's I think that's what they say. State. Four. Huh? Four two fifties. Four two fifties. Well, hold it. You got eight hundred people parking in Laurel. So you're going to move eight hundred cars up there. Where are you going to put the cars for your residents, your businesses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Okay. This hasn't been thought out real well by them. And again, um, I think that uh, the right decision will be made eventually. And there's going to be some unhappy people. Maybe we'll be unhappy, but I doubt it. Because, of course, the key is to continue to write Schrader, write the county exec. You know, he's lost somewhere again on this issue, our county exec, and the current county exec in Howard County. I will, say that, I will tell you that Mary Kay Sigate the chair of the county council in Howard County did not know anything about what was going on until I raised the issue to her. So, thank you, Mr. President. Ms. Nicholas, you have any comments? Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. I just want to thank you for your continued support. Um, I want to compliment um, Donna and Eddie and the council and Christy that how they are staying the course and we're continuing to support to keep the station open. So I just thank you for reaching out on social media. I'm doing the same thing. But thank you for being here. Um, one of the things that, that Donna said is, is very true, and that is that that in our meetings, I, Trader has consistently said that it's up to CSX. So what my next push is going to be, what our next push is going to be, is that we're going to start writing a letter campaign just like the postcards to whoever the responsible person is, the CSX. Miss um, Mills and Miss Mills and I are going to, are looking forward to one day next week uh, calling over to MDOT and trying to get an update and push them a little bit to get back to the table and find out what's going on. But I think I know what's going on. That's what's going on right there. And like I said, I don't know how they can face the fact that we're going to have another thousand people that are going to look to that train station and moving that that far down. The other thing that I, I cannot get my head wrapped around is that the price of the proposed proposed bike path and walking path that's going to go between a half a mile and three quarters of a mile between Laurel Station and the station at the racetrack. The amount of money, 10,000, excuse me, 10 million now, by the time they get around to building it, it's going to be 15 million. We all know how inflation happens with any project. So I know Mr. Hogan, he's cutting all kinds of expenses, cutting all kinds of fees. I don't think that he's going to be the one that's going to spend $15 million for a bike path between two stations. I also don't think that there's going to be many people that would use it. Would you get off the train, getting home in the evening, and walk three quarters of a mile at 5 o'clock in the evening when it's dark out and put yourself in that kind of jeopardy? I think that that's calling into question people's safety, and I'm dead set against it. We are. So we're fighting for number one, leave our station alone. Number two would suffice where they stop the train in Laurel and then they stop the train at the railroad over in uh, the racetrack. Any other questions from anybody? 
we're, we're trying to find out who that person is, and I haven't been able to get that name yet, but that works. Those postcards work, and we don't mind taking our little bit of stipend that we get and putting that out there in order to try and win this cause. And we have some information on the table uh, right outside the door there if, if anybody wants any of that information. And any other questions from anybody? Can I explain? Yes, sir, come forward. Yeah, you there you go. Good evening. My name is Thomas Matthews, the residence of law. I think it's important what Councilman Laird said. The best thing we can do as citizens of law is keep right now county exec, you know, and, and, and tell them how important it is. This can be a win-win for both sides, you know, like unlike like most of the council said, who says that we can't have two stops close there together? So in order, you know, I think the best thing for us to do is is, is keep right now county exec and stress to the gentleman, when you meet with him, how important it is that we want our stop to stay here because there's some history in that stop. And it can be a win-win. All we have to do is, is believe that it can be a win-win, and I think it will be a win-win. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your comments. Anyone else? Come forward, sir. Ladies and gentlemen of the council, um, I just want to say that I'm actually here on my behalf. My name is A. Foreman, but I am an associate attorney at O'Malley, Miles, Nyland, and Gilmore, and we are the firm that's working with the developer on Hawthorne Place. And I just want to let the council know that we've been working very hard with staff to really kind of get this project going, and it should be moving. Our, I should be honest, our developer wants this moving as quickly as possible. And so we, there's full intention for us to do what we can to make sure this project proceed, succeeds. Um, I, we haven't quite filed an application yet, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that I, I could be free to uh, think, divulge at this time. Well, we want to make sure that when you do build it, that it's done right and that it serves the people well. And we will definitely do our part. Okay, thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you. Anyone else with any questions? Yes, sir, come forward. Make those observations. I'm John Floyd. I've lived in Laurel since 1963. And uh, I worked briefly for CSX as a train conductor, so I have a pretty good idea of what they're all about. They are strictly a freight railway. But don't let them fool you. Thanks to the Conrail merger in 1999, CSX Transportation operates more passenger trains over their lines in this country than any other of the major class one railways just by default because they took over so much trackage that had commuter services. That's one thing. About the racetrack, that station at the racetrack opened in 1911 to serve Laurel, Race, Laurel Park and operated during racing season every year until 1967. It was a full service station with long platforms, lots of walkways, lighting, the, the whole thing. And every mainline train, except for the limiteds that, that were nonstop, stopped at both the Main Street Station and the Laurel Park Station. Uh, since then, of course, it's become sort of a flag stop for Mark. Um, as far as CSX and their windows of train service for passengers, they do have morning and evening time periods that they want uh, to allocate for that so that it doesn't interfere with freight. And that's um, there's no getting around that. That's why we don't have midday or weekend service. However, each passenger train that stops anywhere, no matter whether it's at Laurel or, or St. Dennis, which only has a few passengers, is only in the station for maybe one to two minutes, depending on who gets on and off. So there's some trains that travel between Baltimore and Washington as expresses that only stop at a few stations, and they can make the trip fairly quickly. There are all stops locals, which include the flag stop, and these trains might take maybe 60 minutes to make the run instead of 45 or 50. So having all the trains stopping at two stations that are a half mile apart or several miles apart, such as Laurel and Mercury, doesn't make a bloody bit of difference to CSX. You know, as long as the trains are within that overall window from the hours in the morning and the hours in the evening, they're not going to care whether you've got trains stopping 2,500 feet apart. 
Um, the last thing I'd like to say is that um, as, a, as a railway historian, uh, our station has been very special to me. Um, it was the first place that my parents let me wander off to by myself back when I was about 12 years old because they knew that, well, the way mum used to put it, if he's at the train station, then he's, he's off the streets. He's not messing about with dodgy kids. So I'd go to the train station and I got to know the station master who was a gentleman from the B&O called Ted Meyer. He was wonderful. He did all sorts of things he could have gotten fired for. He, he taught me how to fill out way bills and how to um, load and unload box cars and how to call Jessup Yard for pickup and all that stuff. He had, had me doing everything but selling tickets. And my, my salary, if you will, was a, uh, a moon pie and, a, and an RC Cola down the street at the news agency. <laughs> and, um, and I spent all my time at the railway station watching the trains and, and learning about the job and all that. And, um, you know, we've got 180 years of history here since 1830, even though that building's only been there since 1884. So don't let them fool you. Just don't let them fool you. They're going to try, but don't let them fool you. So hopefully we can keep it going then. We're trying our best. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the information. Okay, anybody else? Yes, sir, come forward. How you doing, Mr. DeWalt? Carl DeWalt, 422 Prince George Street, uh, Laurel resident, over 30 years. Maybe I missed part of the presentation. Um, Hawthorne site plan. Now, when that is built, the people from Hawthorne, where, where would they go to catch the train? Is there going to be another site there? Or are they going to go to the Laurel site? They'll go to the Laurel stop. And there are some things that were negotiated in the old 2007 negotiation between the city and Hawthorne. Those things are still under review. And so, I mean, I'll give you an example, like bus service. We're getting our RTA to stop there and then stop at the railroad station so they can pick people up. Obviously, we're concerned very much with public safety. If people decide to walk, walking down, excuse me, walking down Lafayette Avenue in order to get to the train stop or however they're going to get there. All those things are on the board that we will be talking to the developer about and, and Mr. Brock's people in order to make sure that the safety element's there. The, I remember 2007, I didn't know the date, but isn't there a plan to put a garage where right next to the American Legion a garage right in that parking lot or not? There, Wasn't there, there at one time a plan to put The that original there? plan was for a group of people, a builder by the name of Patriot, to build a apartment complex where the big parking lot is now at the railroad station and to then put a parking garage to supplement that parking that would be lost over on the other side by the American Legion. Patriot has not fulfilled their obligations to the state of Maryland who was working with them to do this project. Patriot, the last thing that I knew, was received a letter from the state of Maryland telling them that they were um, behind in their, uh, their products that they were supposed to supply to the state of Maryland. I'm walking a thin line here because I don't want to get sued. So for my part right now, it, it seems like the Patriots in default for their uh, uh, givables to the state of Maryland based on that contract that they signed to do this project. Do you know the distance from between Hawthorne and the Laurel Station? I'm thinking it's half a mile. And the one from Laurel to the racetrack? It's less than a thousand feet. How oh, many? is it less than a thousand? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, because if you, if if something could be put along that, if it's feasible to put along the racetrack, because if you go underneath, now you're going underneath that bridge, and there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of, not of space no. down there would have to be. I, I was just curious because I was just wondering if they were going to try to put something else here as far as the train station goes for safety. No, we can't get them to stop up there, so yeah, they're not going to yeah, stop down there. Sure. But the other part, for your information, it's 2,500 foot from the Laurel train station to the proposed train station over in Howard I County. See. Half a mile. Half a mile. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Any, one more time. Anyone else, please? Yes, sir. Come forward. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it, Mr. Floyd. Anyone else? Okay, we have our date for our next meeting and it's in, a, in a month. And um, we will be here at 6 o'clock. And there, we'll keep you posted. Hopefully, we'll have more to give you next month than we've had this time. But uh, right now, that's all we have. And thank you all very much for coming. Uh, yes, ma'am. Do we have that? Third. Thursday, what was it again, please, Kathy? 16? 15. 15. Okay, so it's October the 15th here at 6 o'clock. Thank you all very much for coming.